أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on this, your live show broadcast directly live from Karbala, the holy city of Karbala, that is to say. I'm your host, Yahya Seymour, and you're joining me for your show, Back to the Basics, in which we discuss the basic contentions between us and others, divergences of opinion, differences of opinion, and how to attempt to resolve those differences of opinion, and how indeed we should engage with those in light of what we could call major doubts. Today, it was brought to my attention early in the morning by the management of the channel that there has been an email sent in and it was an email which I felt was worthy of addressing inshallah ta'ala that is to say that I felt it was worthy discussing the points because at the end of the day we are here to ensure that the viewers do not feel offended and indeed that there is no misunderstandings between us and the dear respected viewers so inshallah ta'ala I'm going to jump straight into the email I may not engage with the email initially in the order of the email because I have prepared everything I wanted to say in response to it, but it's certainly going to take some time. Nonetheless, inshallah ta'ala, I wish to begin with this email, so I'm going to read that straight out. It states the following. Salamu alaykum upon those who follow righteous guidance. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have seen several of the episodes in which you were discussing the intellect. Alhamdulillah, we're very happy that you've seen these episodes. Now, the next part is a direct attack upon myself. Nonetheless, for the sake of honesty, I'll, I'll read that out. You are lying about Salafi scholars and scholars of the Ahl Sunnah. We have the most intellectual methodology, which is to not speak about something which was not known by the Salaf, unlike your religion of innovation. Okay, well, inshallah ta'ala, we'll come to this point. Inshallah ta'ala, if I have lied, then may God restore me to appropriate behavior and may He forgive me, inshallah ta'ala. I do not believe I have lied. Rather, if anything, there might have been some misunderstandings between myself and the text I've been reading, but I do not believe that is the case. I've been trying to stay as loyal to the evidence as possible. Nonetheless, I'll continue. He states, Our scholars do not say that Allah has a body as you claimed. We are not Mujassamites, unlike your early leaders, Hisham bin al-Hakim and Hashim bin Salim. Hmm, okay, interesting. Brother, I've never once claimed that your scholars say that Allah Azza wa Jal directly has a body. In fact, I've tried to be very loyal um, to reading what has been said. In fact, I did mention the specific quotes of that brother, who's in fact an acquaintance of mine, and a Salafi, and an intellectual one at that, who says that Allah does not have a body, yet he does have a form. And he likened Allah Azza wa Jal to Casper the Friendly Ghost. So, I hope that was an accurate portrayal of your theology, inshallah ta'ala, because it came straight from the words of a very intellectual Salafi. Um, in regards to him not being from the Mujassamites or the Salafi, not being from the Mujassamites like our early scholars or early leaders, rather to quote him accurately, and he says, Hisham bin al-Hakim and Hisham and Hashim bin Salim. I believe he's referring to the Hishamain, who are Hisham ibn al-Hakim, and Hisham bin Sawalim bin Salim, uh, or Hisham bin Salim al Jawalaqi, rather. Hisham bin Salim al Jawalaqi. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll have to leave that particular topic for another night. But let me point out very quickly before we get to that particular topic, which of course will not be tonight, that our leaders are the Imams of Ali Muhammad. Alayhum our leaders are the 12 Imams of Ali Muhammad. The 12 Imams who were appointed directly by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through a series of direct succession. Our leaders are not Hisham ibn al-Hakim and Hisham bin Salim al-Jawalaqi. So that needs to be made very, very clear from the inception. Which is to say that I reject that Hisham bin Salim and Hisham bin al-Hakim believed these particular doctrines which you attribute to them. I'm very familiar with the debate. I'm very familiar with the claims made against the Hishamain or the two Hishams. However, I reject this claim. But let's suggest for the sake of argument, they did believe as you claim, and they were in fact, as you claim, Mojassamites or anthropomorphists, then I would still say that we reject 
these beliefs of theirs, because indeed they're not our leaders. Our leaders are the 12 Imams from Ali Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon those 12 Imams. He goes on to state, are your books in agreement with the intellect? Is it intellectual that a man could live for 1,200 years? Brother, in yesterday's show, I tried to delineate, perhaps you sent in this email prior to yesterday's show, but I tried to delineate between what's actually the intellect and what is to observe a common trend. As long as we can observe an, observe an exception to the rule, then an issue no longer becomes non-intellectual. Non what I mean by that is, the intellect does not rule on whether or not someone can live 1,200 years. In the same way that the intellect does not force us to reject the Qur'an, which states that Noah lived for 900 years. In the same way that we do not judge your scholars, who, like a Nawawi, the famous commentator on Sahih Muslim, who states in his Sharh that many of the scholars of his time had met with Khavr, and of course Khavr, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is much older than 1,200 years, and was much older than 1,200 years at the time a Nawawi was writing. So these are not non-intellectual beliefs. These are just beliefs which happen to be contrary to popular norms. But given that we all believe in revelation, and that revelation just tells us about the lifespan of someone, we do believe that it is in the firm capability of Allah Azawajal to preserve someone's life for an elonged duration of time, much longer than the average human lifespan. Just to make that clear. So if you revise what I've said about the intellect, about the rational, irrational, and non-rational, we would see at the very best that Allah in His infinite wisdom, keeping a man alive for 1,200 years, falls at best in non-rational. It does not fall under irrational. And therefore, this is a mistaken understanding of what I have been proposing, promoting, and propagating over the past few nights. He goes on to finally say, if you are very concerned with truth and true view of world, perhaps he means world view here, Allahu A'lam, why will you not debate Sunni? Okay, okay. Well, this is, uh, inshallah ta'ala, brother, we will come to every single question you ask. And firstly, allow me to say that I thank you for sending this question in. Inshallah ta'ala, I pray that I have not offended you over the past few episodes. If I have, it's not been my intention to do so, inshallah ta'ala. Rather, I'm just trying to engage in a productive dialogue. So let's go through these points one by one, inshallah ta'ala. Let's start with the first. You're lying about Salafi scholars and scholars of the Ahl Sunnah. We have the most intellectual methodology which is to not speak about something which was not known by the Salaf, unlike your religion of innovation. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Inshallah ta'ala. I think we've all understood the brother's point. His claim is that the Salafi methodology is, of course, the most intellectual methodology. Inshallah ta'ala, I believe my point still stands, and it still stands that the points I've raised cause us to doubt in the ability of the intellect. But or our ability to trust the intellect, rather. But nonetheless, let's engage with this claim. They do not speak about things which were not known by the Salaf, unlike our religion of innovation. Now, of course, he means Shia Islam, or the original form of Islam, versus the Salafi doctrine. In regards to not speaking about something not known by your Salaf, brother, if you go and view the vast majority of debates that are online, if you read the vast majority of books written to counteract the atheists, even ones which are translated into the Arabic language, you would observe that most of these books utilize a standard which is quite normally dependent upon decent rational argumentation, utilized, prioritized, and taken from people who are not necessarily Muslim in origin. Now, do I have a particular problem with this? Definitely not. Because I believe the intellect is a hujja. I believe that the intellect stands as an independent proof and that it matters not whether or not the intellect which came up with the argument is a Jew, a Christian, an atheist, a Buddhist, a Hindu. As long as the argument is sound, valid, and rational, then I will take that rational argument. In the same way, many of your Salafi brothers and Salafi duat have been doing the same thing in their debates. 
So if you're going to tell me that your religion is not one which allows people to speak without reference to the Salaf, I know that this is a classically made claim, but it just seems to be inaccurate. More importantly, let's assume that it was a religion which only took from the Salaf. That's probably why your religion is failing to counteract the spread of atheism, which is so prevalent in parts of the Arab world, which happen to traditionally follow the doctrines of Salafi Islam. You may counteract that by saying that, look, in certain majority Shia countries, atheism is likewise spreading like wildfire. And I would agree with you entirely. But the difference is when you speak to such atheists, it's normally a lifestyle change, as opposed to an intellectual conviction and conversion. Whereas when you look at many of the statistics pertaining to those in the largely Salafi following world, it's actually a change of beliefs. They go from believing one thing, and not because of a lifestyle change, many of them maintain traditional values as well, but rather they change their minds about doctrines. And this makes perfect sense to me because when you realize that I've been believing in a very limited God that whose existence is extremely dubious, I'm not too surprised that they would be attracted to atheism. Now, I don't say these things to offend you, brother. Rather, I merely want to engage with what you've said. Now, please forgive me if anything I'm saying does cause offense. Sometimes it's necessary in order for there to be light that we bring a little bit of heat to the discussion. So please do forgive me. It's not my intention to offend you. Now you state, again, our scholars do not say that Allah has a body as you claimed. We are not Mujassamites, unlike your early leaders, Hisham bin al-Hakim and Hashim bin Salim. So I've already pointed out who you're referring to. I'm sure it was just a spelling mistake, or it might be that you're not too familiar with early Shia Islam. Again, it might not be your speciality, brother, and you might just be referring to what your scholars have taught you about Shia Islam. So again, we're not going to fault you for that. And I'd prefer that the viewers, again, understand that we all make spelling mistakes. We all make mistakes when it comes to names. I've probably made a thousand spelling mistakes and pronunciation mistakes since the show has started. So this is not something we hold against the brother, inshallah ta'ala. Rather, we deal with a point. You've stated that your early scholars are not Mujassamites. I would agree with you to a certain degree, but I would reject what you say to another degree. So do they necessarily affirm what we would call a jism for Allah Azza Not necessarily. There are those who refer to Allah Azza as having a shape, but without necessarily having a jism. One of them is the brother I, I quoted earlier, one of my acquaintances, uh, Bassam Zawadi, who likened Allah Azza wa Jal as, or likened our understanding of how Allah Azza wa Jal has a form to the way we can understand Casper of a friendly ghost. And he stated if we can understand this for creation, then we can understand this for the creator. Now, I've already commented to death on that particular comment and that particular argument. But what I'm trying to state here is that I've never once emphasized that Salafi scholars believe Allah Azza wa directly has a body. That's not a claim I've made. Nonetheless, it's necessary for us to deal with this particular claim as well. Inshallah. Inshallah ta'ala, dear viewers, I'm going to cite a narration which is found in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, which illustrates that Allah Azza wa if this narration is true, does have a body. But I've just been informed by the brothers that we've got to take a short break. So I pray that you join me after the break and we'll discuss that tradition. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us on that short break. We're going to go through this text very, very quickly, inshallah ta'ala, because there are a lot of time constraints and I don't want to dedicate more than one episode to this particular email, inshallah ta'ala. So please forgive me for speaking at such a fast pace. I only do so in order that we can deal with this topic within the constraints of this episode, inshallah ta'ala, and afterwards we will revisit what we were discussing about the intellect and the concept of worldviews. The narration, as is found in Sunan Abi Dawood, is as follows. The Holy Prophet ﷺ stated, Do you know the greatness of Allah? Truly His throne, His Arsh, is on His, is on his heavens. 
and he formed with his fingers something like a dome over him, and it groans on account of him like a saddle groans because of its rider. A saddle is, of course, that thing which we put on a horse before we mount a human being onto it. This is the istiwa mentioned in the Quran. Because of it, the arsh makes a creaking sound. Now, this particular hadith is known as hadith al atit which means that sound which comes from creaking. And that sound is made because of the weight of Allah Azawajal upon the arsh. Now, just to cite all of the Salafi scholars who actually believe in this particular narration, and they're not just Salafis, there are mainstream Sunni scholars in here too, inshallah ta'ala. I'm just going to cite them quickly. Ibn Taymiyyah, one of them. Uthman bin Sa'id al-Darmi. Ibn Hazm. Ibn Khuzayma. Salman bin Sahman al-Najdi. Al-Albani. Half of al-Zahabi. Half of Abu Dawood. Al-Imam half of Mahmoud al-Dashti. Excuse me, dear viewers, I'm just browsing through these pieces of paper very quickly. Al Haf of Al Maqdisi, Al Hakam al Nisaburi. Al Doctor Ali bin Muhammad bin Nasr al Al Faqihi. Al Sheikh Musallat Atibi Al Utaibi. Wa Sheikh Adil Al Hamdan. And inshallah ta'ala, that suffices from the names of those scholars who believe in this particular doctrine. And also Sheikh. Al-Jibreen, one of the famous Salafi scholars of this era. So when we look at this particular narration, what do we see? Let's look at what the narration would demonstrate if the narration were taken at face value and taken to be true. It would demonstrate that Allah Azawajal must have a physical presence, that is to say he must be physical of some sort in order for this pressure to be applied that would cause the arsh or the throne to make this creaking sound which is made when a rider mounts upon the saddle of his riding beast. So we see that this particular narration implies that Allah Azawajal is physical. It also implies that Allah Azawajal is mounted upon an arsh, again that the arsh is physical too. So these are some of the things that we would derive from this particular narration. So I believe that when it comes to this, again, we do have justifiable reason to state that your scholars are at the very least indirectly anthropomorphic. That is to say, they do indirectly, even if they do not affirm it with their own mouths, believe that Allah Azawajal has a body. So those are those concerns. I've already dealt with a claim that are your books in agreement with the intellect? Is it intellectual that a man could live for 1,200 years? So allow me to quickly now deal with a last question, which I believe is probably the most important one to you, brother. If you're con very concerned with truth and true view of world, which I believe he's talking about the true world view, the concept I've been mentioning throughout this show, why will you not debate Sunni? It's a very good question, brother, and I do thank you for it, inshallah ta'ala. In the past, my dear brother, I used to be very concerned with debates, and I would have been more than willing to engage in a debate. But what I found is that debates, as the scholars say, as the scholars of akhlaq say, they al khasoma or the act of aggressively debating is something which makes the hearts hardened and they remove the hearts from the remembrance of Allah Azawajal. And so the Imams have generally given us principles which is not to encourage debates unless the person who is debating is particularly gifted and follows directly the statements of the Imams. Do I trust myself to be particularly gifted or follow necessarily directly the statements of the Imams? Inshallah ta'ala, I try my best to follow them. But do I believe in the fruit of debates? No. And that is why generally you will see that the people who do such debates are not scholars. And in fact, it is the scholars who are against such debates because these debates are done in a particular format. They're utilizing particular structures. They take into account only one side of evidence. So normally it's the opposing side or the Sunnis who will define what is evidence for us. And I don't believe that we should allow anybody to hold us ransom to their canon of evidence. And more importantly, they discuss issues which are not primarily fruitful. The Quran in telling the Christians or in telling the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa about his dispute with the Christians, it could have easily mentioned that you are a prophet. It could have easily mentioned that dispute with them over the crucifixion because that's their whole belief in salvation, which is a flawed belief. 
Instead, it said what? It said, come to a common word that we should worship another than Allah. Do Christians claim to believe in one God? Yes, absolutely. If you read their creeds, it's very clear they make that claim. What is the problem? The problem is their belief in that claim is one which is compounded. And so we would argue that by necessity, even though they affirm one God, this belief boils down to a belief in either three independent, standalone, all-powerful gods, or it boils down to a belief in three deficient demigods and not a single god. So when we see these things, and when we see that this is the approach the Quran advises us to take, we would likewise say that the first place we would need to discuss, and I say discuss, I don't say debate, is the issue of Tawheed. Before there can be any discussion on anything else, we need to discuss number one, can we trust the rationality? If we can trust the concept of rationality, do we agree that this concept of Tawheed is restricting Allah to a deficient demigod? And if it is, then we need to resolve this issue before we can move on to any other issue. So I am willing to discuss this, inshallah ta'ala. I'm not willing to debate it. Debates are a very, dare I say, problematic concept. And when I say discuss it, inshallah ta'ala, I'm more than willing for anyone to join me here in the holy city of Karbala. Their safety is guaranteed by us. We'll fly them out. We'll bring them to the studio and we'll have a very polite and friendly discussion moderated by an independent, unbiased figure. There's plenty of, there's plenty of non-Muslims who are available that we can bring over. And I'm sure they'll be willing to adjudicate this discussion in a very befitting manner, inshallah ta'ala. But more importantly than that, there is the real question of whether or not anyone that would come forward to debate would actually represent anyone himself. Because you see the traditional Salafi position is that they do not discuss with the Ra'us or the heads of the Ahlul Bid'ah. And what we mean by that is the heads of the people of innovation. Now for, for them, someone like ourselves or someone like anyone that sits on a Shia channel would be considered as falling under this definition. So if this is the case and it's stated that the asl or the origin point is not to discuss or sit with the people of innovation, then we would find that again, such a person would just be dismissed by their own scholars and they would not be considered as being representative of traditional Salafi scholarship. There is one clause to that, of course, which is that someone that has graduated and is recognized by Salafis as representing the Salafi scholars, has a form of tazkiyah from their scholars, then of course such a person would be worthy of discussing with, as I said, moderated, academic, intellectual discussion. But a debate, no. And that's why we find that when you look at even what their own scholars say, just to quote Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i, who is considered to be one of the Salaf for them, he states, I never debated anyone whom I knew to be established upon innovation. And of course, Al-Bayhaqi comments on this, that is because the one who established upon innovation very rarely returns from his bid'ah. Indeed, debating is with the one who is hoped will return to the truth when the truth is made clear to him. Inshallah ta'ala, I, I, I pray that I'm one of those who would return to the truth if the truth was made clear to me. But what I'm trying to say here is that such claims are very, very problematic in light of those who go around asking others for debates. Because the question would be, who do you actually represent? If your scholars are saying these things, and these are apparently the position of your scholars, then we would question, we would be forced to question at the very least, are you considered as being representative of anyone? Have you studied the foundational principles of your own school of thought? Because if you have, then you probably wouldn't be someone coming out for a debate. And this is our experience of Salafi scholars. There, there is, of course, a couple exceptions to the rule, but this is generally the traditional position. Now, it's quoted in Sayyid Alam al nabala of Al-Vahabi that one of the scholars called Al-Qasim bin Uthman Al-Jawai states, If you see a man debate, then know that he loves leadership. He's someone that loves leadership. He's someone that loves to get himself out there and promote himself. Inshallah ta'ala, we hope that no one falls under that category and that we discuss for sincerity and not for purposes of our own egos. That's what I would like to say to this brother who sent in the email. I do thank you for your email. And again, 
please forgive me if I've offended you in any way. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us and thank you for bearing with us patiently. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank <laughs> you.